Hi there, and welcome to the channel of A Disappointed Man with me, Jason Kennedy, The Disappointed Man. And in this video, I return to one of my favorite writers, Thomas Bernhard, the subject of the most popular video on this channel with over 300 views, which is an introduction to his novels. Today, however, I'm going to talk about his short story collection, The Voice Imitator. Now, The Voice Imitator is made up of 104 extremely short stories, none of which exceeds a page in length, and many of them touch upon typical Bernhard themes such as madness, murder, and suicide. There are, however, many light-hearted pieces. What they all share is the deep philosophical cast which marks all of Bernhard's work. Now, of course, with this number of stories, I can't talk about too many of them here in a short video, so I'm just going to pick out a few that I found particularly interesting, and they are drawn from a subset of stories which feature newspapers in some way. Either they resemble newspaper articles in their form, or newspapers are touched upon in the story. So let's begin. Now Bernhard had a great passion for newspapers, which he repeatedly mentions in the interviews he gave, and in Wittgenstein's nephew, his short novel, the narrator describes his relationship with newspapers in terms not dissimilar from the author's himself. He writes, I attach the utmost importance to reading books and newspapers every morning. In the course of my intellectual life, I've specialized in reading English and French newspapers, having found the German press unbearable ever since I first began to read. What is the Frankfurter Allgemeine, for instance, compared with the Times, I've often asked myself. What is the Süddeutsche Zeitung beside Le Monde? The answer is that the Germans are just not English, and certainly not French. From my early youth, I've regarded the ability to read English and French books as the greatest advantage I possess. What would my world be like, I often wonder, if I had to rely on the German papers, which are for the most part little more than garbage sheets, to say nothing of the Austrian newspapers, which are not newspapers at all, but mass circulation issues of unusable toilet paper, now this mention of nations and newspapers in the same breath recalled to mind this excellent book, Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson, because Anderson examines how the rise of nationalism in the 18th century was closely linked with the rise of novels and newspapers. And what he points out is how when we read a novel or a newspaper, which are largely fictitious creations, we are drawn into a world full of persons, objects and events which we recognize even if we have not had direct experience of them and we become a member albeit anonymous of a geographically and linguistically bound community and this sense flows back into our everyday life and is what provides us with a sense of a coherent world that we and others are moving through so what happens when an individual's faith in this imagined community breaks down and they feel themselves detached from it, gripped by an overwhelming sense of the futility of the life that they're leading. Well, there's a great example of this in Alberto Moravia's 1929 novel, The Time of Indifference, when a young student, Michele, is concerning himself with this very question. It goes like this. That day, as he was walking slowly down the crowded sidewalk, he looked down at the hundreds of feet shuffling along in the wet and was struck by the futility of his own movement. All these people, he thought, know where they're going and what they want. They have a purpose and so they hurry along. They're tormented, sad, happy, alive, while I, I have nothing, no purpose. If I weren't walking, I'd be sitting down. It makes no difference. He couldn't tear his eyes away from the ground. There was truly, in all those feet stamping through the grime, a kind of certainty, a faith he didn't have. And as he watched them, the disgust he felt for himself grew even greater. So, he was this way wherever he went, aimless, indifferent, and this rainy street was his very life, travelled without faith and without enthusiasm. Now what McKayley is wrestling with here are the brute facts of existence in a mass society, namely that you are anonymous, that no one cares who you are, what you do, what you think, what you believe, or what you have to say. And for us as individuals, this creates an overwhelming sense of futility. And it's this dual perspective 
which I believe Bernhard is homing in on when he satirizes the newspaper form. He's trying to push us away as readers from reading as members of this imagined community and instead approach it from the side of the individual because Bernhardt's art is overwhelmingly the art of the individual opposed to the nation, opposed to society. And I'll just give you one example which illustrates this. This is called Unworldly. Because of his acquaintance with a once gifted composer, whom we ourselves for years had dubbed a non pareil genius, a skilled cabinet maker from Maria Saal, a favorite place of pilgrimage in Corinthia, discovered literature and wrote poems and little comedies, which, however, according to those who got hold of them, were on the one hand totally unreadable, and on the other totally unactable, simply because no one understood them. The cabinet maker drowned himself in the Langsea on his 22nd birthday in despair of being so unappreciated. The newspaper that published a short obituary of the unappreciated young man emphasized above all else that he was unworldly. Now I found the title of this story really interesting, unworldly, and the way it's being used as a pejorative in the newspaper obituary, because the young man already had his trade as a cabinet maker, but he could not give up his dreams of artistic success. And it really speaks to me as an individual, because I'm conscious of having to work just to maintain my place in society, but I'm absolutely not happy with that place and I'm not happy with the kind of work I have to do. I'm overwhelmed, like Michaeli, like this gentleman, by the futility of existence. As you may be aware watching this channel, I've been teaching children now for over 10 years and I'm deeply frustrated, I'm deeply disappointed. My dream, it may sound crazy at this moment given the state of the humanities, is to be a university lecturer on English literature and I absolutely sympathize and identify to an extent with someone prepared to hurl themselves into the sea when they see no way of realizing their true ambition for their existence. So this story really spoke to me. There's another story I'd like to read and I did find this one deeply amusing and it's called Schleunberger and it goes like this. In Alsace, we learned that a man from Celestat in Colmar had been placed in the old people's home because his family had stated that he was 80 years old, which was borne out by his papers. He himself, however, had constantly maintained that he was only 60 years old until the family could stand it no longer and determined to hand him over to the old people's home in Colmar. Indeed, the man had reiterated his claim day and night and had, in other ways as well, made his family's life a horror. He is said not to have washed for years, and to have always walked around barefoot, and to have exposed himself from time to time, totally naked on the street, all of which would have sufficed to have him committed to a lunatic asylum, which they did not want to do to him. And so they determined to send him to Colmar. After reaching Colmar with the greatest difficulty, he had broken away from the nuns who were taking him into the old people's home, and could only be recaptured several hours later. The nuns did, however, persuade him to enter the old people's home without putting up any resistance. During the night, the man, whose name is stated to be Schleunberger, set fire to the old people's home in Colmar, and all 478 inmates were burned to death, and so was he. Now I did struggle to read that without laughing, and of course, if it was read in a newspaper, it would be an extremely poor taste to begin chuckling over these terrible incidents. However, again, I think it's pointing us towards our dual perspective as either the anonymized member of mass society or as individuals because placing oneself in the position of the old man in this story is quite a thrilling experience. We see him fighting his battle, convinced that he's 20 years younger than it is claimed he is, which in itself is rather ridiculous, but who knows? Maybe he is 20 years younger and maybe it was him who was in the right all along. Then we see him outraging society. And again, there's that part of us, I believe, as individuals, which can get satisfaction from this. It very much puts me in mind of watching that movie Joker with Joaquin Phoenix, because when the Joker transgresses, we enjoy the reaction, the shocked reaction of the other people, the stiffs 
that make up society. And so here there's a kind of lunatic pleasure that it identifies deep within ourselves, and so I'm chuckling at that. And then it builds towards this moment where he breaks away, and then he's recaptured. And I like this lull where it says that they recaptured him and he agreed to go inside without resistance. It kind of hints at the fact that he may already be hatching his devilish design to cause an inferno that night. Yeah, that is there, isn't it? And then at the end, as members of a mass society, it's strange that the one thing we fear the most is being caught up in these mass deaths, like these mass shootings, or an airplane crash, or a giant earthquake, and that is here too. And I'm also drawn towards the number, which gives it this kind of authority. And thinking of Bernhard sat at his table, trying to determine the perfect number of fictitious inmates to burn alive also has me chuckling. So I suppose the point here is that I myself, the disappointed man, Jason Kennedy, why I love Bernhard's work so much is that I'm already always reading as the individual. It's what I prize the most. And I do see society as an all-out war on me. I do see it, as I titled my Bernhard video, as one against all. And many of these stories are one against all. I've only been able to go through two. I haven't said necessarily that much that you'll find enlightening with regard to the rest, but hopefully I've given you a brief flavor. For those who have read the novels but haven't read this yet, is it a worthwhile purchase? Absolutely, it's a joy to read. And for those yet to get into Bernhardt, you could still appreciate this too. One thing that really comes across in these stories is his absolute mastery of technique. They're extremely satisfying when you just analyze them from that point of view. There I think I've said enough for today. So by way of farewell, I will repeat my mantra. Be safe, be strong, and until the next time, Nanu Nanu.